Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and welcome to part 5 of our 6-part Aether Revolt full set review. Today we're going to look at all of the green cards, as well as the Selesnia and Simic cards. And if you've been watching the series, you kind of know what to expect. We're going to briefly look at each card. We'll talk about its implications in Limited, and then any card that has the power level to potentially cross over into other formats, we'll discuss that as well. Having said that, before we get started, if you check out our description below, you'll see some links to our Amazon affiliate store. If you make any purchases through any of those links, a small percentage will come back to help support the channel. It's very helpful. We have some new Ether Revolt stuff on there as well. And you'll also find links to our Patreon page, another way to support us and keep us doing what we're doing with these videos. That's always, always appreciated. All right. Having said that, let's get into the cards. We got a lot to talk about. And we're going to begin with Ether Herder. Uh, this is the last one of the cycle we've been looking at all week. And basically all these cards share the same abilities. They enter the battlefield, they give you two energy, and when they attack, you can pay two. And if you do, you get the 1-1 one, one servo artifact creature token. Now, the other ones had keyword abilities attached to them. This one, being the green one, doesn't get a keyword ability. It just is bigger. <laughs> so you get yourself a 3-3 three, three for 4. And that is actually pretty economical and limited. Like, I'm happy playing a 3-3 three, three for 4, and you just get upside on top of it. So this is a fine limited card. Now, I might like the red one and black one in this cycle a little bit better, but this is very decent. Ether Stream Leopard. Uh, this is a nice little trampler beater really for green and it's at the common level if you're looking for a good three drop i think this is a decent one so you get yourself a two three with trample and when this enters battlefield you also get an energy but whenever it attacks you have the option of paying an energy to get the plus two plus oh so it attacks in at least a lot of the time is a four three trampler i like that because i feel like so many times these cards attack in as a four two trampler and that's just a little too fragile for me i really appreciate that extra point of toughness and because of that yeah i'm happy to run this in limited. Next we have Aetherwind Basker, and this is a big creature with a big casting cost, but it also has a big effect for giving you a lot of energy. So it costs three green and four. You're getting a seven seven trampler, that's pretty cool. And when it enters the battlefield or when it attacks, you get energy for each creature you control. That can be pretty significant, especially if you have a bunch of little creatures on the battlefield or, or servo tokens, something like that. Also, you can pay energy into it to get plus one plus one till end of turn. So you can go in for a real big strike, and it's hopefully generating a good amount of energy for you too. So if you can swing the casting cost, we'll talk about limited first. If you do come across this mythic, yes, play it as long as you think you can cast it. If you're comfortable with the three green, your deck's maybe a little heavy green. There's a lot of decent ramp in green. We're going to look at some of that today. Then, yeah, this is a fair card to play and you could do very well with it. This could be game ending. And again, it might not feel great if you start pouring a lot of energy into this and then it gets destroyed in removal. But at the same time, hopefully it's creating enough energy for you that you're not putting any more energy in than you're gaining. So you're not really losing anything at the end of the day. So, yeah, great beater for limited. Uh, you could argue that maybe in standard with all the ramp that's out there that this could see some play. But here's the thing with that. I just think there's just so many other good ramp targets. I mean, cards like this just kind of sail under the radar because you just have other great targets out there, which is kind of sad in a way. Aid from the Cowl. Okay, I always say I hate five drop enchantments that don't do anything on their own when they come into play, and that's basically exactly what this card is, but you know what? I'm intrigued by the power of this card. This card can do some incredible things, especially if your deck is tailored to it. So let's say in draft, I pick this early in pack one, and then I can build around it a little bit. I steer clear of instants and sorceries. I try to go for maybe artifacts and enchantments to fill those roles, and I have a card now that... I play on turn five or six that every time I revolt from that point forward, I'm getting a free card. That actually feels really good to me. <laughs> so I, I like that idea a lot. Yes, I don't like the idea of taking the turn off to play it. I mean, there are times I might be able to get the revolt trigger on the same turn, especially if I have a unconditional sack outlet or something, but that's not guaranteed and that doesn't make me happy, but I do think the power level is strong enough. Having said that, I also think that potentially someone could produce something interesting with this in Standard. The big question for me with Standard, though, is how many instances of sorceries in your deck makes this card bad? And the reason I say that is because you got a 60 card deck, you're going to need some answers to at least sideboard into some of the problems that are out there. So you need the removal spells and stuff like that. So at what point do the removal spells and that type of thing you're bringing in outweigh the... Uh, 
positive effect of this card. And that's a question you're going to have to test, I think, and figure out and try to play with some different builds to see. If the answer is that you can still keep some of that stuff and this card is still very good for you and you can still hit all the revolt triggers pretty consistently, then, yeah, this could be a standard deck. I feel like, and we're going to see this a little bit later as we go, I feel like there's going to be a chance to have a very interesting Selesnya deck on our hands with some of these cards. So uh, this could be part of that deck maybe, but overall very very good card and yes you take a turn off but the power factor makes me feel pretty good about it druid of the cowl uh, this is your mana dork for the set i don't have a whole lot to say about it i mean mana dorks aren't one drops anymore they're two drops and they usually try to give you some other little advantage to it for paying the extra mana this time you get a three toughness card which is actually kind of relevant considering you got shock in the format that helps keep this thing alive a little longer so that's good it's a common you'll be able to pick these up good ramp card for you in limited green belt rampager this one's very very interesting to me okay it only costs one if you have two energy to pay you have to leave it on the battlefield uh, if you read the wording here it says if you can't pay the two energy return this to its owner's hand so you can't use this as a way to like bank a bunch of energy and keep triggering revolt forever unless you have a way to siphon the energy you get from it when it returns to your hand into something else then you actually can keep playing this card for continuous revolt triggers for one mana that's intriguing, right? <laughs> uh, but the other thing you can simply do with this card is play this on turn one, return it to your hand, get an energy, and then turn two, you return it to your hand, get an energy, maybe get a revolt trigger and get something else to happen if you're real lucky. And then finally, turn three, you just go ahead and play a three, four. Pretty good beater, right? So I do think that this will see some standard play in a deck that's maybe looking to go a green aggro. And don't know if we'll see that right out of the gate in standard because there's some great aggro decks right now and Boros Colors out there that this will be competing with. But I do think there's some pieces here for maybe a really cool Gruul aggro deck. And there's also some strong Selesnya pieces going on as well. Green Wheel Liberator, another really strong beater. This one costs two for a two one, but that revolt trigger is pretty serious. If you can hit revolt, this comes into place a four three. A lot of folks comparing this to Tarmogoyf just simply because of the low cost, high power toughness. There is a big difference though between a four three and a three four. I will tell you that a four three much more fragile than a three four, and you do want to take that into account. But having said that, still a great card. This will see standard play because of the potential benefit here of the high power and toughness, and this will be good for you in limited too. Plays really well with the previous creature, so you could really line this up with the elephant we just saw too. By turn four, actually have yourself a four three and a three four on the board. That's a pretty good start in a limited deck for sure. Heroic Intervention. This card's phenomenal. Two casting cost instant deals with so many different problems. The art's a little strange on that, a little cartoony, but aside from that, card's awesome. Uh, it does so much for you. Permanence you control gain hexproof and indestructible to lend a turn. Protects your permanents from removal and that's permanent. That includes lands, enchantments, planeswalkers, artifacts, creatures so versatile it's going to deal with so many problems that you could encounter out there and even in combat you can use this as a combat trick just making your stuff indestructible is a nice way to mess up combat math and really mess with either blocks or if you're attacking than your opponent's blocks so really awesome card yes this will see standard play and uh, this is incredible and limited too next we have hidden herbalists and these cards that cost two and potentially can give you two more mana, which allow you to sometimes play an extra two drop early on in the game, actually have been very powerful in the past. And I think this card could be very similar. Granted, you have to hit the revolt trigger to make that happen. So maybe this is more of a turn three play and not a turn two play or something like that. But if you can play two, two drops on turn three, that ain't bad, right? So because of that, I think that this has some standard potential. And also, this will be good for you in limited. Very good for you in limited. High Spire Infusion. Uh, this feels a little bit like a Giant Growth. It costs one more, but the upside is you get two energy out of the deal, too. Giant Growth, great card. I don't think adding an extra mana and giving you two energy makes it that much worse. So, again, I think this is a card that could see some play in standard. I mean, Giant Growth has in the past. But also great for you in limited awesome combat trick at instant speed 
Lifecraft Awakening, another instant that really works as a good limited combat trick. And what's nice is this time you get to keep the plus one plus ones in the form of counters. Now, sometimes these cards are a little awkward because they do require you to hold up a little bit of mana, which uh, could be for a situation that may or may not come on the turn. But what's kind of nice is if you're attacking and you're being aggressive, then I'm holding back my mana. And if I need to use this, I do. If not, then on my second main phase, I play something else. So there's some versatility here. Very good card for you in limited. Lifecraft Cavalry. All right, a 4-4 four, four Trampler for 5 in limited. I'm okay with That's a decent creature. But if I can revolt, I go ahead and get myself a 6-6 six, six Trampler. All right, sign me up. Yeah, this card's awesome and limited. Uh, this is probably on the cusp of being standard playable. Uh, for the casting cost, though, I think it falls just a tad short. But this is actually a pretty strong card. Very happy to run this as a common and limited. You'll be able to find these. Life Crafter's Gift. Uh, this is okay in certain decks. It's an instant. Again, it works as a nice combat trick. I'm not going to run this, though, if I don't have a lot of other good ways to add plus one, plus one counters to creatures. I don't think it does enough just to add one plus one, plus one counter for four, even at instant speed. But if I have a lot of cards that do that, then this is fine to run. Malfist Revolutionary. Another nice trample beater for limited. 3-3 three, three for three. And you'll notice that green, of course, has a theme of adding plus one, plus one counters. And that works great, not only with other colors, like we've seen the theme kind of replicate itself a little bit in blue, but also there's some great double strike creatures in red. Uh, but even within its own color in green, there's creatures with trample to get advantage out of this ability, which is pretty cool. Uh, this one takes it a step further because when this enters the battlefield or dies, you get a chance to... I do kind of like a watered down version of proliferate. And that means for each kind of counter on target, permanent or player, you give that permanent or player another of the same kind. So this can target not only plus one, plus one counters, but this can also target loyalty counters on planeswalkers. This can hit energy counters on you. So there's just a lot of versatility to a card like this. I really like it a lot. Great for limited. And again, another strong uncommon. That seems to be the theme of this set in general. Great, great uncommons and some really good commons too. Monstrous Onslaught. Uh, I think it was Dragons of Tarkir where there was the card, I think it was called Tail Slash, that was a red card and you would just take one of your creatures and then take its power and hit another creature with it. This is kind of the same thing and in green, which is pretty interesting. Uh, it doesn't give you the ability to choose but you're going to choose it makes you choose your highest power creature but that's fine and then you can actually divide the damage up among other creatures really really interesting so yeah it costs a little bit at five and it is a sorcery not an instant but you know what great removal for green green doesn't have a lot of options so this is a pretty nice one narnum renegade another decent uncommon Paying one green for one, two death touch? Yes, yeah, sign me up. I'm not even reading that revolt trigger. <laughs> I'm done right there. I'm going to play this card in limited. As a matter of fact, I mean, there's been some one drop black one, one cards with death touch that have made it into standard in the past. <laughs> so this thing could even see some standard play. And oh yes, if you revolt, it comes in as a two, three, even better. Uh, but still very good card for a one drop. Natural obsolescence. Uh, this is good. It's an instant for two. It's going to deal with an artifact. Downside being it doesn't deal with artifact or enchantment, which a lot of these type of spells typically do. But the upside is that there are a lot of weird situations in both this set and Kaladesh where you have cards that can take artifacts back from the graveyard. So if you really want to put the kibosh to that, <laughs> this card will do it and by putting it at the bottom of the owner's library. So also on top of that... You could potentially, in a pinch, use this on one of your own things to trigger Revolt if you really, really wanted to, so that's nice. I'd be happy running one of these even in my main deck in Limited and then potentially siding another one in if there's a lot of targets for it if or if my opponent has a lot of artifact recursion, something like that going on in their deck. And yeah, I do think this could be a decent sideboard card for the same reasons in Standard. Pima Aether Seer. Uh, this is a way to actually get a fair amount of energy for four mana, and you also get a 3-2 body, which, yes, can be a little fragile in the world of shock, but at least it's something that could add some extra value to this card, too. Oh, and by the way, 
You can also pay three energy and target creature blocks this turn if able. So it just gives you a little more to do with your energy potentially. And it's pretty decent. I'd be actually pretty happy to run this one in limited, especially if I'm on the energy plan. Prey Upon. Uh, this is a reprint, of course, and this is always welcome in limited. Green just needs something to deal with creatures, and this is a cheap way to do it. Yes, it's fight, so sometimes you are sacrificing your creature too, but for one mana, and even at sorcery speed, this is pretty much almost as good as it gets for green when it comes to removal. Ridge Scale Tusker. Uh, this card's actually pretty interesting to me. It's a 5-5 five, five for 5. It doesn't have evasion or anything, but you get a plus 1, plus 1 counter on all your other creatures when the center is the battlefield. This could potentially be a lot of power and toughness added to your board state for 5 mana. That's kind of a big deal, actually. So, I, I love this Unlimited. I am on board 100% with this card. Happy to play it. Again, another really good uncommon. And as far as standard goes... If there is a deck out there, maybe running a bunch of small creatures at some point down the line, this could maybe even see some standard play. Even at five, I feel like you could get a huge benefit with just being able to add, even if it was just seven, seven power toughness to the board or eight, eight power toughness, it becomes very economical. Rishkar Pima Renegade. Here's the legendary creature in green, and this card's awesome. I really like this quite a bit. It's a 2-2, two -two. yes, fragile. However, when it enters the battlefield, it puts two plus one plus one counters on each up to two target creatures. So that could be itself as one of the creatures. So as long as you have one other creature in play, you're actually getting four, four power toughness on the board when you play this for three. Super economical on that point alone. Also, giving this a plus one plus one takes out a shock range. That's kind of nice too. On top of it now, each creature you control with a counter on it, has tap to add to your green mana to your mana pool so it also works as ramp phenomenal card and it's legendary so you do on one hand want to be careful how many you run in a standard deck or something like that but this is the type of card that your opponent will be gunning for if they're worried about your mana advantage so this could be destroyed a few times during a game having extra copies in your deck won't be a huge detriment i don't think uh, this card's doing a lot of stuff for three mana I really, really like this one. Fantastic and limited. And yes, this is definitely seeing play in standard, no doubt. Rishkar's Expertise. Now, you know how I feel about these expertises. These are all awesome. Now, this is the most expensive one at six, but it does also mean that you're going to get a free spell that's potentially more expensive, five or less. Awesome. You could be getting maybe 11 points of economy out of a six casting cost spell phenomenal i love this card and you know what i mean draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control even if that's like a three three like you're still drawing three cards off this thing and playing something for free and you draw the cards first so maybe you draw into something really awesome to play phenomenal card this is seeing standard play just like all the expertise they're all seeing standard play and this is going to be phenomenal if you're lucky enough to get it in limited too Scourging Vandar. Uh, this is actually pretty interesting. It's a two drop, two two at common, and those are always good in limited. You you want some good two drops to kind of fill out your curve for sure. And what's weird about this one though, it gets two plus one plus one counters. It's a zero zero creature, but then at the beginning of upkeep, you may move any number of those counters to other creatures, which is interesting considering there is a plus one plus one counters matters mechanic going on as we've seen but also too if you wanted to you could just move the two counters somewhere else and this goes away which turns on revolt for the turn too that's pretty interesting right so yeah this is doing a fair amount of stuff for two mana and because of that i think this will be a great card for you limited especially at the common slot and if there is a standard deck out there that's really interested in making sure it always hits revolt who knows this could even see some play there silver weaver elite uh, this is actually pretty decent in limited two two reach for three i found in the kaladesh world that i really liked reach creatures there's a lot of small flyers that are just really annoying out there and reach really slowed down my opponent a lot of the time so i think that will be the same with e3 volts i'm happy to play this and oh by the way it has revolt and if you trigger that when it enters the battlefield it replaces itself even better unbridled growth 
I really like the design of this card because yes, it's just color fixing for green, but it only costs one. And then so many times you play a card like this and then it turns out that either you got another piece of fixing and you're able to cast easily whatever else you're trying to cast. Maybe you're just splashing a third color or else that one card that's a third color comes up and you cast it and then this thing is just on the battlefield doing nothing else for the rest of the game. But this time around you can sacrifice to draw a card. So it does replace itself if you don't need it anymore. That's actually pretty cool. I like that. Find card for limited if you're trying to go for maybe a third color or if really deep maybe with a fourth color if you're being super greedy. All right, here's the Selesnia cards. There's a few of them to look at, and some of these are big, and probably none bigger than a Johnny Unyielding. All right, so here's the deal with a Johnny. Some people are a little split on him. A lot of folks don't like his casting cost being six. However, you got to look at recent history, and we've seen a lot of six casting costs. Planeswalkers make a splash, even if it was a temporary splash. <laughs> we saw Soren at six do very well. We saw Chandra at six from Oath do very well. We've seen in the past Elspeth at six. So six casting costs, Planeswalkers, if they're good enough, are going to be very standard viable. So let's look at this one. Is this one standard viable? Four loyalty. Well, that feels a little weak for six, but plus the plus ability is a plus two. So it quickly brings it up to six. Okay, feel better. Reveal the top three cards of your library. Put all non-land permanent cards revealed this way into your hand and the rest in the bottom of your library in any order. Okay, yes, you can miss with this. You could hit lands. You could hit instants and sorceries. You're looking for non-land permanents, but you know what? You're getting two loyalty. So even if you miss, you're getting some benefit out of it. And when you don't miss, especially if your deck is built to hopefully mitigate that risk as best as possible then you're getting card advantage here. Card advantage, huge deal. Now let's look at that minus two. Exile target creature, its controller gains life equal to its power. I don't care about the life gain. I want to get rid of a creature that's keeping me from winning the game or keeping me from not winning the game and killing me. I'm going to use this ability and be very, very happy about it. And you know what? You can simply play a Johnny, and as long as he can stay alive, you just use that ability twice and call it a day, and that's actually pretty economical. Now, as far as his ultimate goes, it takes a little bit to get to it, though do remember you are going up in increments of two. The minus nine, that feels more like a commander ability to me. This could be really cool in commander, especially like a Super Friends commander deck or something like that, uh, but it does have a possible implication in some standard games too, no doubt. Having said all of that, I think this card is very standard playable, and I think Selesnya has some powerful cards to back it up. We're going to see some more as we go forward here, but I mean, imagine playing a Selesnya deck with this, with the card we're about to look at next, and also Gideon. There's just so many really powerful Planeswalkers. You could almost start to think about a Selesnya, almost Super Friends style deck that has a lot of little creatures and things like that to back it up, and it feels like it could actually be very standard viable. Uh, also, limited, yes, if you get this in limited, congrats. You're going to have a good time with it for sure. It's going to be really, really awesome. Uh, great card, and like I said already, has even some great implications for commander decks too. Oath of Ajani, so I just alluded to this one, cost two legendary enchantment. When this enters the battlefield, you get to put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. Again, important in a world where plus one, plus one counters can matter at times. And Planeswalker spells you cast also happen to cost one less. So that takes the previous Ajani's cost down to five instead of six. That's kind of nice and does feel even more economical. But maybe more importantly, this means you can play a turn three Gideon. And Gideon is definitely a force out there. And you do have to wonder, too, when they were designing these sets, how far in advance did they know about the standard rotations? And you kind of wonder, did they think Gideon was going to be leaving the format quicker than he actually left the format? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But uh, regardless, like I said, I think you can really build a nice standard build with some of these cards and brew something really interesting. And yes, this will see standard play. It's very, very good. And this is still good for you in limited, even if you don't have any Planeswalkers. The first ability, I think, is more than good enough for two mana. And yes, again, commander players happy to play this, especially in Super Friend style decks. All right, our last Selesnya card of the day, Renegade Rallier. And this is a 3-2 gold card. We're seeing a lot of these 3-2 gold cards with good abilities. This one is a great one. I love the fact that if I can hit Revolt, 
not only am I getting myself a 3-2 for 3, but I'm returning a permanent, mind you, a permanent card for my graveyard to the battlefield that costs 2 or less. So that could be a land, again, it could be an artifact, creature, what have you. That's pretty versatile. I like it a lot. Yes, 2 toughness, a little fragile, but combined with that ability, you're getting a lot for 3 mana. And because of that, I think this is standard viable, as well as a very good limited card. Finally, our last card of the day is the Lone Simic card of the set. Another 3-2 gold card. Imagine that. Human Rogue, this time around, this enters the battlefield, you get to draw a card, and you get two energy. Uh, so, yes, great advantage in a couple different ways for Limited, because for three, you get a nice size creature, it replaces itself, and notice this isn't even a Revolt Trigger. This just happens. <laughs> it replaces itself, and you get the two energy. Excellent, especially if you're in the market to accumulating some energy. Great, great card for you, Unlimited, for sure. And I think it's actually good enough to see some standard play. Maybe not quite as exciting as the previous card, but if there's a deck that's out there looking for energy, this is nice because it also has the card draw attached to it, too. Having said that, those are all the green cards in the set. And also with that last one, we wrapped up all the multicolor cards too. So that leaves only one thing. Tomorrow we'll be back with all the colorless cards. That includes the artifacts and also the vehicles, of course. And the one lonely land card that is all by itself. We'll look at that too. The day after, we'll be back with our Ether Revolt pre-release primer. And if you watch those type of videos before you know that the primers are really for new players. Maybe you've never gone to a pre-release. We're going to talk about what to expect, what to bring. I'm also going to talk about the inventions in that video. So if you are curious on my thoughts on some of the inventions, you might want to tune in for that at least. But until then, thanks as always for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and have a great day. Hey, thanks as always for watching. This video is made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store, where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon, and have a great day.